Friends, good evening. Very warm welcome to you all this evening to our evening worship service. Let's begin, shall we? And sing Psalm 145, Scottish Psalter 145. Singing from the first version, this is page 442 in the Psalm books. Psalm 145, and singing firstly verses 1 to 6. I lay extol my God, O King, I'll bless thy name always. Thee will I bless each day, and will thy name forever praise. Let's sing down to verse 6, these verses from the beginning of Psalm 145, singing from verse 1. Extol my God, O King, I'll bless thy name always, thee will I bless each day and will thy name forever. for those who can't be out tonight draw near to them there's many we think like Daniel who, who when he prayed these three times a day would do so with his face toward Jerusalem and your people pray for your church that gathers and when even to know some who've been unable to move much of their 
later lives to testify to experiencing that as a place of prayer. An undesirable situation in itself, but one that was used mightily by you. We pray for any who may be lonely and downcast, who may be feeling today the, or remembering the days when they could be with your people. We ask, Lord, as well for those who are feeling not just um, cut off in terms of people, but maybe struggling spiritually, and where they're reaching for you and praying, maybe searching for you in their lives like they've never done before, trying to make sense of situations that almost, if not actually, militate against what we'd call common sense. We thank you, Lord, for the true humanness of the characters you show us in your word. We think, among others, like the sisters of Lazarus, who both, on meeting you individually, to tell you that, or to share the, the grief that their brother had died. They both said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In the sense that they have a bitterness, if that's the right thing to say, they certainly seem to be blaming you indirectly. We thank you, Lord, for the honesty of these disciples and how you have recorded their words for us, but also your response to them and how you dealt so patiently in assuring them. As you'd assured the disciples on their first hearing of Lazarus' news, they say, you said to them, the sickness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. And no one made any sense or understood, but like so much with our lives, it's afterwards we see we see where your footsteps have been. We maybe can't connect all the dots and find a picture of tracing or trying to work out your message to us in our circumstances in life. But you've given us your word to clarify. You've given us your revealed will in human language. And Lord, for the patience and the prayerfulness to wait with your word open to hear what like the psalmist said, what God the Lord will speak. And as well as we think of that when we come together this evening, as we're singing and seeking you in prayer, and we'll open your word to read. In a few minutes, we ask, Lord, for your blessing and your presence. That still, that hushing, that exhilarating awareness of the majesty of God of these realities of the world that is largely to us unseen and eternal, but form human expressions in the words that you've given us so that we can relate to and understand up to a point the truth that you're revealing to us from heaven. The most important things for all of us to, to hear and listen to. But we, we know us well and we remember it in our lives. Some of us maybe can remember it maybe more clearly, that when Paul plants the seed, maybe people here were growing up under certain teaching or whatever it was, and it wasn't under one ministry or under the next ministry, but maybe another time came when you gave the growth and the seed that was sown, the word that was shared, and the fullness of time took root, took hold, and changed that life. And it wasn't down to anyone or any organization, though people and organizations are involved. The cause is your gracious, glorious power being revealed in the heart and sometimes in such an imperceptible way, but the divine dynamic to change us. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. She is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And may we know this great change, all of us. May we discover that you are the living God. May we come to know you as the risen Christ. You've said and say to us in Revelation 1, and what an awesome saying, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And for that discovery and for that familiarity and for that 
ability to draw near to you. When you've said to us through James, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. But are we serious? In a sense, we're, we're maybe frightened or scared to be. But like Moses was when he didn't cross any lines, but his desires ran away with him when he prayed and asked that you would show him your glory. Something he didn't at that very moment understand because of your response to him that no one can see you and live. But for something of that awareness, that we're not keeping up any tradition or a habit on this day of the week, the way maybe people might be looking on and thinking and wondering why we're even bothering in their eyes. But it's the truth that sets any one of us free, and because it has, and because you have appointed your church, you have given us your word to share you have given us your word to embrace and to gather like this with the church to, to worship, to call upon your great name, to listen to your voice. So hear us, Lord, as we're praying. Lead us into your word. Remember all who need you. We're praying, Lord, for those down in their health, those laid low in suffering mentally and physically, spiritual struggles, family struggles, work struggles, church struggles. In the world you will have tribulation, you've said. But be of good comfort, I have overcome the world. And wherever that's coming from, whatever the difficulty or the challenge, to see it as coming from the hand of the Lord. And to know the joy of the Lord as our strength. How strange, Lord, that you give us burdens to cast them back upon you. If we understood the process and if we were able to, to cast our burdens upon the Lord that we would know that's divine sustaining. We'd maybe know more of what it means to have your strength perfected in weakness. Guide us, we pray. Protect and keep us, forgiving us, and all we ask in is in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue in this same Psalm 145, same version, Scottish Psalter, uh, this time page 443, 443. Sing down to verse 14, 145, first edition at verse 9. The Lord Jehovah unto all his goodness doth declare, and over all his other works his tender mercies are. Thee all thy works shall praise, O Lord, and thee thy saints shall bless. They shall thy kingdom's glory show, thy power by speech express. From verse 9, let's sing to 14. This is Psalm 145, the Lord Jehovah. The Lord Jehovah unto all his goodness doth sin shall bless. They shall thy kingdom's glory show. Thy power by speech express to make the sons of men to know his acts done mightily and of his kingdom the excellent and glorious majesty thy king shall forever 
understand thy reign through ages all. God raiseth all that are bowed down, upholdeth all that fall. Let's turn to the Gospel according to Luke, and we can read chapter 19, Luke 19. Luke 19, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. But he was about to pass that way. And, G and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down. For I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And the case stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, if, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave each of them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered those servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your minas made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall, be, you shall have authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, or entering you will find a cold tide on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as, they, as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King 
who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words and so on. May God bless his words to us. We consider them this evening. Let's turn to Psalm 118, 118. Uh, Scottish Psalter, verse 22. This is page 399 in the Psalm books. We're singing from verse 22 of Psalm 118. That stone is made head cornerstone, which builders did despise. This is the doing of the Lord and wondrous in our eyes. This is the day God made. In it will joy triumphantly. Save now, I pray thee, Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Let's sing from verse 22, shall we? Let's sing to the end of the psalm. That stone is made head cornerstone. That stone is made head cornerstone, which builders did despise. This is the doing of the Lord, and wondrous in our this is the day God made in it. We'll joy triumphantly. Save now, I pray thee, Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity.
Let's turn back to our reading in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 19. You can read verse 41. Luke 19, verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, we're told that he wept over it. It's not the only time we're told of in the Gospels about the Lord weeping. Not the only time we're told about his what's called lamenting or expression of sorrow, grief, if that's the word, over the rebellion of Jerusalem. But it's one of these parts in the Bible that might be a problem for people. Remember when the Lord brought Lazarus back, that time where Lazarus' sisters were, they were complaining and in their bitterness and their sorrow they were saying that if the Lord had been here, if he had been present, the, their brother wouldn't have died. But in doing that and showing their grief, they're doing what is very small compared with the Jews who are looking on. So there you've got Lazarus and the two sisters, Mary and Martha, they were very close to the Lord. The Lord loved being in their house. He loved being in their company, and they loved his company. Lazarus became sick, and he died. And Jesus waited until Lazarus died before he came back to where the sisters were and where Lazarus had passed away. And they were thinking he must have some reason for not coming before now, questioning his motives and asking why it was that he didn't come when he could have. But those who were looking on as well, when they saw Jesus weeping and when they saw the effect of everyone crying, it was, a, it was more of an anger. It, was, it wasn't, the, 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 you know, the, when there's a weeping that's powerless and there's a helplessness to it and there's an agony all of its own where you can't help. But this, this was different weeping. But people looking on were looking and saying, well, couldn't, couldn't he who... who, see, who, who couldn't he who healed the blind man also have kept this man from dying? There's the question. And more and more, it's maybe a question that we're having to face and try and battle with and make sense of, not maybe so much for ourselves. But there's, there's no denying the fact that the Christian church is, in terms of its um, message, it's not, not in terms of its triumph and its victory, which is success, guaranteed and in God's terms it's not what Paul says in 2 Corinthians that the Lord always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ it's the concept of following the Roman general the Roman leader in procession after attaining a victory the, the church is always but by that we're following the victor following Christ his cause will triumph his cause will prevail and his purposes and plans will never come short of being fully realized. When the sisters are saying to him on that occasion in John, if you were here, dot, dot, dot. And when we've got these times in our lives where we've got the questions about why, when, what about this, did I do that? And you know how endless it can be with all of these questions. To be at that place where we were able to, if at all, to stop and to embrace the fact that he is in control of it. No, we can prevent it from happening. We can't undo when it has happened. But maybe what he's saying is wait. And like he said to, wasn't it through Moses, stand still, the Red Sea, and see the salvation of the Lord. There's something godlike, can we say it? Not about something godlike in, you read in, in, in the Bible, reading in his ways. He's got a way of hemming people in. You know, like the, the Israelites with Pharaoh behind them landlocked on either side and the sea in front of them right, well where are you going and God says stand still and look and see and it's the standing still that's going to be the arena as it were for the miracle to come not when people are busy and not where people are trying and maybe the Lord is saying through all of that it's bringing us to that place of stopping and leaving it and saying stand still and see and it doesn't feel comfortable we can imagine the Israelites we can even imagine Moses being afraid of what's happening. And the Red Sea wasn't a puddle. It's not where people will try and measure how people could have crossed. 
we know the Red Sea became like a wall on either side of them, so it was massive. It would have been, no doubt, because of the wind, it would have been very noisy and glorious. All of these uh, amazing things. To be in that nearness and to be in that place where in life we're able to say, this is the doing of the Lord and its wonders in our eyes. See, people, however, might look at you as a Christian and think you need to have all of the answers. And part of the, the difficulty, that, what we're about to see here with Jesus weeping there at, the, in, at uh, Lazarus' tomb, we read of him weeping here in, in Luke's account as he's approaching the city of Jerusalem. And it can wrongly lead sometimes to the impression that he's crying because he can't change it or that he can't do anything about it. And sometimes people can, you know, test your faith and challenge you because if you think about God, as, as he speaks to you and speaks to me in the Bible, he does reveal his character, his love, his grace, his mercy, his long-suffering, all of these amazing characteristics, putting, not just putting up with and bearing with sinners like us who are the opposite of not only what he what he wants but of what he is but he is so patient at the other side you can see things happening and whether it's floods or fires or earthquakes or volcanoes or accidents or wars and the end the list is endless it goes on and on and then people might think well wait why is God allowing this to happen you ever heard people say that kind of thing and when you're growing up it's more and more going to be hitting you on from either side and you might be tempted to question why and it's always back to the bible that we have to come some people will say you see if your god isn't stopping all of these problems and if your god is so full of love and compassion as the jesus of the new testament we see him and the people say what they say and they say well if, if if that's the case it means he's not got the power to stop it well he's got all the intention and all of the the good will and the good intention but he can't do anything it's as it were his hands are tied behind his back. He hasn't got the power to, do, to lift a finger. They say, well, what kind of God is that you're believing in? The tears Jesus weeps are not the tears of helplessness. Nor are they the tears of someone who is dependent on a human reaction to his mission. Now, that's a deep one, that, when you stop and think about it. This isn't something that's looking like a failed mission. Well, if Jesus is so important and if he's come from heaven, why are they not all? Why is the world not going after him? Why are we reading on Wednesday night about the, the world going after Satan? Well, that's the way people think. And um, yes, sometimes it's in the silence and it's sometimes in the minority that God is doing all the work. It's not necessarily in the big and the numerous and the abundant. We get that wrong sometimes. It's to discern the presence of the Lord where he is and to recognize that like that, where he's working his purposes out, when we're seeing things going wrong, it's not that God is so loving, but he's so powerless. It's not that Jesus is unable to change anyone. And sometimes to kind of say that, you know, that there's one of the churches in Revelation, it's a, it's a lovely picture, but where the Lord's speaking to, he's speaking to the church. He's not speaking to the unconverted or to people like when we were all on that broad. He's not talking to people like that where he says, I, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know where it is? Standing at the door and knocking. And you've, you've maybe seen, I can't remember who did this, there's a, there's a painting, a painting done I don't know, does it go back quite as far as Bunyan or related to one of uh, the Pilgrim's Progress illustrations? But anyway, I'm not saying this is what's in it, but it's what reminds us of it as though he were on his knees at your heart knocking to get in. And he's as though he's crying, wanting to get into your life. Sometimes the way he's put across, as though he needs you or needs me for his life to be enhanced and complete. To reach that full satisfaction. Now, because, because it is his plan and, and, and was the Father's will to give you, to give his people to his son, that of course is a great, 
a great objective and a great goal. We thought of it, read it in the morning, it was quoted in the morning, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And there in heaven, John 17 is telling us, he's praying. He's praying, Father, I will that those whom you've given me will be with me where I am, that they may see my glory. There he is. And in his majesty, in his sovereignty, in his perfection. You know, the picture that we see of him here at Jerusalem, it's what one of the old Puritans called the Redeemer's tears wept over lost souls. When we're thinking about this not being what some might say a sign of a failed mission, this isn't the weeping of, you know, people didn't respond. If it, was, if it was up to the church to convert anyone, up to any Christian to convert anyone, it would be the quickest way to despair. Or else, thinking of it earlier on, at home, you can, well, so be careful when you say things that can come the wrong way. But sometimes people will say that the, the church is, when the church is reduced or there's not many people or certain things, it's dead. But when another church is always active and bustling and always moving and on the go and you know that's sometimes viewed as a sign of life but you know the opposite can be true in this sense i never crossed my mind to this i would be thinking you'd have thought of this long ago but it's it's when some you realize something it's amazing isn't it that sometimes it's when things are dead spiritually as as, as we dare to quantify then if we're going to get everything else to kick start things it's almost running on adrenaline it's almost running on. You could do all of these things in a society, and I'm not saying it's wrong at all, but just in this respect of noticing, of noticing the reality and noticing the presence and noticing the power of God. Sometimes it's in the silence. It's sometimes the stillness. It's, it's recognizing. It's not, you know, and, and um, it, 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 it's not to not be active and not to be busy or organizing. It's not that in any shape or form. I hope that make, makes sense. But it's, it's when when not the organizing but when the events take the place and it's it's something keeping on going but it isn't necessarily well uh, bible centered see we've got this view of where the presence of the lord is there is always going to be phenomenal power in the surrounding area is that always the case that's a question a real question how do we, can we look at even Jerusalem? And what would we say about what our Lord did in speaking to them? I don't know where you feel about that. You remember a, a, a hearing someone, a, a dear man, saying to another person on, on their induction, and they went to a certain place and then bumped into them a while after, and so there'd be no sinners left there. You know the enthusiasm or the expectation, and um, you know you can ha you can have an ex uh, you can have a relative explosion of things where things look. I mean, how do you quantify things spiritually? That's a, that's a massive question. Jerusalem, and here is the great Messiah, and he's at the end of teaching them. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He hasn't finished teaching them, but his teaching ministry is coming to an end. And what would people think? What would people? What would they maybe, you know, come to assume? Well, you wonder, and you see him weeping. But these these tears are profound. You know, when we when we try and and try and enter in, into what's happening here, when we take the teaching of the Bible about who this person is, no mere man. We know he's no mere man. It's like he says in John to Philip, where Philip's wanting to see the Father. He says, have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still yet you do not know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Me not meaning the physical form, but meaning the expression of character. The brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of his person, the revelation of who he is to think of this person 
the Son of God, as man. The human tears, someone else said, was Fred Lee who said this, and what I thought, the human tears of a divine person. It's, it's, it's where it's mysterious. It's, we can look and say, you know, you ask the question we're reading, why is he weeping? As he, when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. We know why, because of what he's saying. But we think of him weeping, of such a person being able to do that. God giving expression to such <laughs> profundity by way of human emotion. How is that possible? Well, we don't know how it's possible. And we can say, but does God have feelings? And then you know the way it can, we just look at this and it's with that. Yes, it's with that. Oh, pure John Howe, H-O-W-E, you can still access this. And he's speaking in terms of the divides, the divine redeemer. And his tears wept over human souls, lost souls. What's he saying to us? Well, you remember that, that uh, the verse 28 and following is shown the triumphal entry. The people were wanting to coronate him, and they were shouting and singing and praising and adoring. But, and they, this is his disciples, we notice, but they're missing the point altogether. They're thinking this is now like David's son's coronation. We're going to make him king. We're going to set him upon a, the throne of his father, David, and he's going to rule there forever and ever. The Lord knows this isn't going to happen. He's on his way to the cross. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to fulfill the work he came into this world to do. But there are his disciples, and they don't have a clue about this. They've tried to banish the idea of the cross, banish the idea of his, his absence from them. And so they're trying to hold on to him and make him to be their king and make him to stay and make him to be in this place. But he says to us, verse 42, would that you, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace. In Jerusalem and the Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees, even as he's coming into the city, we're told that, um, verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples, because they were, they were praising him. They were singing these praises. So you can, you can see everyone is here, and including these Pharisees, who were, along with others, the spiritual educators, meant to be teaching people, explaining the Bible, explaining things about the Messiah, pointing out the truth that they needed to know. But they're missing the whole point, missing that he is the point. Didn't he say that in John 5 when there were some of the, the Jews, they were arguing with him, and they, you know, they'd love it. There's nothing wrong with it in itself. But wrong in, in, their, in their way, of course, like the woman at the well in John 4. And they're going to do a theological debate, debating the Bible, arguing about things, and trying to, um, trying to find out the, the, the truth and trying to get to the bottom of things. But though they were involved in challenging him, though they were involved in undermining him, what they were effectively doing was blinding the nation. They may have been guarding the truth that God had deposited and they're meant to be sharing that truth. It's like if you ever have a look at some of the amazing revivals in the, in the books of King, the Kings and also the, the books after the exile, Ezra and Nehemiah, and how central the word becomes in everything that and God is doing this amazing work, reviving, refreshing, reinvigorating. And the, the word is so central, and the word is being opened and shared, and it happened in the Reformation. It's, that's what it was, and providentially you can think well yes even before that with the, the, the even think of alexander the great the conquest we came to the greek empire and the spread of the greek language and greek became the language of the new testament age the roman road structure was in place it was all ready for the gospel to go in the language of the people and so it did in the time of the reformation the printing press was discovered and then translating the bible and the whole of Europe just went ablaze. You see, the church was, that's an inverted commas, was keeping the Bible from the people in more ways than one. You see, when the people got hold of the Bible, it got hold of them. God blessed it, and a great work took place. 
See, the people in Israel, they were in Jerusalem, they were meant to, these leaders, to be guarding the truth and looking after. But see, the Lord is saying, rebuking them, is he not? It's written, verse 46, it's written, my house shall be a house of prayer. You see, these are the men, these are the people meant to be looking after. I mean, the precincts, the, the precincts around the temple, they've been, you know, buying and selling and money changing come because people coming at Passover time, they'd come. We read of Simon the Cyrene this morning. He was um, from Libya. As he'd be, like Acts 2 tells us, people would flow to Jerusalem from all around the Roman Empire at Passover time. And um, in, in that way, what, uh, what we, we should be, what, they should, what these leaders, what these people should be really doing is, is sharing and establishing and circulating the truth that God had put there. But unlike that, what they're doing is actually preventing the people from seeing it. Would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. There's a sense where that's really all found in him, personified. He came to them, did he not? And repeatedly, repeatedly offered them through signs, through miracles, through wonders, through repeated and patient teaching. He gave them the opportunities and they didn't want to listen. They didn't realize that he was who he said he was. John makes that abundantly clear, chapter 1. They, they didn't recognize him. The kind of person that's described, verse 28 to 40, is the kind of person they were looking for. A small, a small shadow, maybe, but nonetheless, looking at someone who would come and conquer and reign in Jerusalem. And it's the opposite. They're looking at the crown. It's all about the crown. It's all about the throne. And he's explaining to them it has to come by way of the cross. Satan's attack he said to Jesus, you remember our Lord was showing him in a flash of time, in an instant of time, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. He said, well, these are mine and I'll give them to you if you just bow down and worship me. And what was Satan basically doing? He's saying, you can have all authority over all nations. You can become the king of kings if you just worship me. No cross. You can have your crown. Come this way. It's like the Garden of Eden. It's always the way he works in the subtlety. A little diversion and uh, sometimes not an, an outright affront, uh, an attack like that. But at the same time, it's to be, to be aware and, and, and really to be listening and to be evaluating and taking real serious stock of what the Lord is doing. Like his own people didn't recognize him. He said to them, walk while you have the light, while he's present, because it was going to be taken away. And that's what he's saying to them. If you had known, especially in this day, the things that make for peace. But he's saying, now they're hidden from your eyes. And by meaning someone personified in him, by his being taken away from them, their access to him is going to be finished. And so the opportunities and the peace and the blessings that he's extending to them now are, are no longer going to be theirs. Now, that's not individually, not uh, addressing everyone personally there. But it's referring to the city. It's referring to Jerusalem. And it's referring to what all that city and all these people represent. And he's explaining that. The day of opportunity is gone. Would that you, even you, Jerusalem, had known on this day the things that make for your peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. And this is the explanation. For the days will come upon you when your enemies, that's the Romans, will set up a barricade around you, surround you, hem you in on every side, and tear you down to the ground. You and your children within you. And they'll not leave one stone on another. Here he says it again. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. It's a sense where we come right back to the beginning. And we think about why. Why does God allow this? Why does he allow that? And we'll finish in just a, a minute. It's lovely having the children out tonight and having them with us. We don't want to put too much um, that way. But you know, when Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70, AD 70 by the Romans, 
It was a horrific massacre on a large scale. And we're seeing horrible things on the news, you know, in cities and, and villages and people and seeing all of the heartbreak and in parts of uh, different parts of the world today that what, what happened among the Jewish people, it has a, an additional significance. Not that we're saying their suffering was worse. We don't mean that or to put suffering against suffering. But it had a specific significance. So we're going to read it in the morning and... and um, realize the connection between that and this in, in the afternoon so when the women a group of women were around Jesus on his way to the cross remember we saw in the morning Simon was compelled seized Luke says Simon of Cyrene who laid on Jesus the cross to carry it behind him here it is there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. This is him going to the cross. This is when Simon's had to carry. He can hardly, he can't carry the cross anymore. He's exhausted. Like, seriously. And it may even be the case, and this is not to go on, there may even be the case, there's reason to say that he might even have been assisted on his walk by the, the soldiers, but maybe come back to that. But these women, they're saying, they're mourning. He, to them he turns and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, <clears throat> Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, to the hills cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? That was the Lord saying, Don't weep for what you're seeing just now, but weep about what's coming to you in a few years. Weep for yourselves, he says. Weep for your children. Don't weep for me. How could he say that? Can you see where he is? Where his mind is? We can't identify or relate to it, but where he is, it's the will of God. He is so intent, and he is so delighted, and he is saying it like the selfless sayings you see from the cross. And he's saying, do not weep for me. For Jewish women to say it's a blessed thing to not be a mother says everything about how woeful the situation is. But you know, there's, there's one thing when we were reading, when we, when we think about it, when we read about how he says these things and well, how could they do, how could this happen to Jerusalem? Even, you know, when, when they're saying this and behaving like that, how could the Lord, we say, maybe bring all of these things? The reason, you'll see, it happened because they said something. When Pilate was trying to clean his hands, as it were, he was doing everything he could to pass the guilt of Jesus away from his own hands. And in doing that, we were reading, you may remember earlier on, where Pilate is saying that I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. I'm free from the blood of this innocent man. But then the people answer. He says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered. Now listen to this. His blood be on us and on our children. That's what they said. That's what they said to Pilate. And what is Jesus saying? Well, he's saying it the next day. Don't weep for me. He's saying, weep for yourselves and for your children. There's one thing he says. If they'll do this when the tree is, or the wood is green, what will they do when it's dry? It's meaning the Romans. If the Romans will do something so severe as they're doing to me when I am innocent. What do you think they'll do to you when you are guilty? That's a huge statement. But I think that's what it means. It doesn't make sense in, in, in the illustration otherwise. But, the, you know, it's, it's comparing this is bad. This is bad. You're weeping for me. But you've got no idea what you need to actually weep for yourselves. 
because the Romans will be merciless, and they were merciless. Crucifixion itself was something they'd perfected and enhanced and became so hardened to that they could even mock you when you're hanging there dying. Well, he says, the time had come and gone for them, but we're still here, thankfully. We have the opportunities and we have the Bible. We have, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunities to pray and, and to hear once again the Lord calling to us that we would uh, seek him and find him and to know him for ourselves. We'll, we'll pray just now. We'll sing shortly. We'll, we'll pray just now. We do thank you, Lord, for this time, for this opportunity. We pray that your word will be living and powerful in us and through us and central in our lives that we, through your words, will know that living reality of the living God. Communicating with us, speaking to us, and we would speak with you in prayer and in meditation and in thought. As David said at the Psalm, end of Psalm 19, he said, Let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Mary so. In Jesus' name. Amen. We will sing once more to conclude. We'll sing Psalm 147, 147. And there's a sing Psalms 147, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 147. Page 192, sorry, in the, in the Psalm books, if you're using the books. Page 192, Psalm 147, at verse 1. O oh, praise the Lord, how good it is to sing him songs of praise. How pleasant to give thanks to him for all his gracious ways. Let's sing from the beginning of the psalm. O oh, praise the Lord, how good it is to sing him songs of praise. How pleasant to give thanks to him for all his gracious ways. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, and he it is alone who reaches out to Israel to of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.